Hey, good afternoon. This is Tyler Brown on Wedge Return. I want to thank Nick Banstra for allowing me a chance to do this and, and provide some football knowledge to you guys. Uh, just on your screen there, a couple words, credentials that may give some credibility possibly. Uh, I am currently a pass game coordinator, coaching receivers and kickoff return. I still uh, coach the other side of the ball, assisting defensive backs and special teams as well. I've been a coach for uh, 20 years coaching football at the middle school and high school levels as well as college. I've been a former defense coordinator, special teams coordinator, and director of football operations. Uh, we've had a, we had a pretty good year this season on kickoff return, uh, what makes it successful, and uh, why it was successful is we got more players involved uh, the way we did it in terms of uh, first unit, second unit, et cetera, plus we got our coaches involved. We do coaching by committee and uh, we, from the get-go, we had that house-it mentality that we want to take everything in the house if possible. If not, we could still get our offense great field position. Uh, our goal is 35-yard line or, or beyond. Um, usually, um, once we declare that we got a pretty good unit or things go well throughout the season, it can force teams to do more blooping, squibbing, have bad kicks, kicks etc. It also will set the tone for your offense or, or possibly for the game and or, you know, it's a big momentum changer as I'll, I'll show you here in a couple slides uh, how that helped us out offensively or throughout the game. So uh, the question is, do you do sideline return? Do you do wedge return? Can you do both? Uh, it's going to matter. It's just going to basically be about your situation. So a sideline return, basically, if you, you know, as you look at sideline returns, most of it's man to man. Um, if you're going to run it, you're going to need to make sure you put in the practice time for it and be able to make those man adjustments as necessary. Just like with any other kickoff return, um, you're going to have to start early in the season, uh, two-a-days, et cetera, and you're going to have to put the time in it. If you're going to do a sideline return, you definitely probably need to make sure that you, you allow more time in your practice periods. If you see a predictable kicker, consistent kicker, um, a kicker that's going to kick it deep, you know, 95% of the time or bloop it 95% of the time. In other words, you got, you're facing a good, good kicker. That's where sideline returns come in. Um, if, the, if the kickoff or coverage is, is a typical coverage unit and it's pretty simple with no twisting and things like that, exchanging lanes, then again, you could use sideline return. Uh, also, if, they, if the kickoff unit puts the ball in the middle, uh, they go five by five or even four by six possibly on a hash. Again, if, if, the, if it's a good kicker, someone that you know is consistent and you can get a sideline return going, then go ahead and use the sideline return. On the screen, you're going to see an example of a sideline return that I used uh, in years past. We were not a sideline return team this year uh, for various reasons. I'll explain later, but uh, you can see there, this is one example of a sideline return. I, I really don't want to go in the nuts and bolts of that. That's not what I'm here for today. But if you're looking for something, um, it's pretty basic. You've probably seen it before. You could use uh, this sideline return. This other option here is another version of the sideline return. I picked up a couple weeks, a couple weeks ago at a clinic. Um, I think it has its benefits. Um, it's it's got some good things that is probably better than the one I just showed you, but. Again, that's up to you. It depends on, again, what type of uh, kickoff coverage teams you're facing, what they're doing with their one and twos, with their force guy, with their contained guy, with their full guy, you know, that type of thing. What are they, what are they doing? Um, you know, again, are they five by five? Are they four by six? And uh, you can take a look at those two different sideline returns. Uh, what we were this year was a wedge return type of team. Um, and I, I can show you why here. On the screen, you, you see that one reason to do a wedge return is possibly practice time is limited. So maybe you go in in August and you know that you're going to do both, let's say, or you're going to do sideline and you just don't have the practice time down the road uh, to do it or install it or work on it, then I would suggest that you do a wedge return. It's got easy zone adjustments. Um, also, knowing if you know you're your kickers or what you had, what you were facing the previous season, you know, are the kickers unpredictable? Are they inconsistent? Um, what type of kickers are you facing in your league, in, in your conference, in your schedule? 
that's where the wedge return is, is a little bit better, in my opinion. Uh, the kickers are, again, squibbing it, have low trajectory, not getting a whole lot of high on the ball, where you have the time uh, to, to do some kickouts and do some angles uh, with a sideline return. Um, then again, wedge return is probably better for you. Um, if they have a complex kickoff coverage, I would say in our 12 games last season, only one kickoff unit was complex in terms of shifting, moving guys around, um, having different formations, etc., cetera, uh, placing the ball in different places. Now we had some other teams that did variations of that, but not to the full extent that I just said. So again, a wedge return can help fix those problems and you can still do wedge with a four by six or five by five, um, whether it's on the hash in the middle, doesn't matter. So let's start with the middle wedge. Um, the middle wedge, uh, putting the ball in the middle of the field. We ran um, what would be more like a single wedge return where um, we could do a six man front or a five man front. And most of the season we did a six man front, but we ran into a situation where a lot of teams wanted to, to do some onside or some quick kicks or some line, draw, line drive squibs, uh, hitting our gaps, uh, blooping it, that type of thing, a little bit more consistently. Again, going back to that team that had a little bit more variation to their kickoff. So we went from a six man to a five man. But either way, if the, if the ball is in the middle of the field, your, your front row uh, was usually determined or predetermined week to week. We usually put our better guys to what I call the front side, uh, guys that we would predict if the kicker was more likely to kick that way, we'd put our better guys to that side, guys that I, I trusted that we could field the ball to that side. Uh, we started off staggering uh, just slightly our tackles, and I'll show you what that looks like on another slide here. But um, we did a couple different ways. You can start them off and then shift them back as the kicker follows through in, in his steps. Uh, you can start them off five, seven yards back. That's up to you. How you, however you want to do that. Again, that probably depends week to week and what you think the kickoff unit's going to do. Um, when we ran this single wedge or middle wedge return, uh, again, that's when the ball was in the middle of the field. Our front guys had man responsibilities. So, um, and I'll show you on the next screen where that, what that looks like, but we blocked uh, number three, four, and five from the left side and the right side. We never blocked number one and two from both sides. We always counted inside out. Um, and so, or sorry, outside in. And then obviously we wanna make sure that we're blocking inside out, of course. We eventually moved back to a five man front. And again, it didn't, it didn't change what we were doing. We just lost the man up front. So he became a man up in the back basically, or had to cover that responsibility, those, those blocking rules. So, we still block three, four, five on both sides, but one of our wedge guys had to block the backside number five. And what determined front side and backside again was a week to week thing. And again, based on tendencies, et cetera, we determined that going into a game. Uh, the second level or the second row, they still had wedge responsibilities. You know, set, set, set the wedge right over top of the ball or in line with the ball. Um, and then whoever didn't um, catch the ball deep obviously had to fit into the wedge in some way, shape, or form. And then we got a go call by the return man to, to get the wedge going. So here's what you could see what our six-man front looked like against a five-by-five five middle of the field kickoff team. Um, again, we counted three, four, five from outside in, and then we blocked inside out. So you can see our guard tackle in. We're responsible for uh, three, four, five. And then our, our back three middle guys were in a wedge um, formation. And that was basically up the middle. Um, once we hit through the wedge, we're gonna get what we can get and take what we can take uh, from that point on. If we eventually went to a five man front where we had to take one of the extra guys in the wedge and they had to block number five on our back side. So in this picture here, you can see um, our, our left side was our front side. And so they picked up three, four, five from the left. Our right side was our back side. They picked up three and four, and then our back side wedge guy uh, had to pick up number five. The other three guys to the front side in the wedge still maintained a wedge uh, formation. So 
entering the season, uh, game one, uh, we had a gauntlet of a, of a preseason and a gauntlet of our, it was going to be our first four games. So this was going to be a critical game for us. Game one, um, start of the second quarter, we were down eight to zero. And it was the sec second kickoff or kickoff return of the game. Um, and you can see here in this video, it was, it was versus a five by five uh, kickoff team kicking from the middle of the field. And so, <clears throat> so here you see five by five, balls in the middle of the field, and get a quick glance. Uh, we had six guys up front. You can see at this point in the season, we showed all six up front. They were staggered. And then as the kicker took off his first two steps, uh, then those two tackles released and got headed for the wedge. And so, again, if you follow the rules, the ball's in the middle of the field, five by five, we're going to be in a middle, middle wedge uh, kickoff return. And so these front six guys block three, four, five, three, four, five uh, from outside in. As you can see, uh, this front hits about at the 35. They're going to block their men somewhere between the 40, 35. And that's going to depend on the kick. It's going to, it's going to change week to week, et cetera. Our three guys in the wedge are getting ready to block about the 30-yard line. This kick hit about just inside the 20 so that you can see the separation is going to be key, how far apart from the first line, the second line, to the return guys. Okay, That's stuff that you got to work on. And th those back five guys, that chemistry has to, they have to jive. They have to get their timing down throughout practice. So you can see, again, as I continue to pause this, that we pretty much got hats on hats. Um, you know, we got we got our three, four, we got our six guys up front blocking, three, four, five to both sides. Our wedge guys are waiting, okay, and then they're finally getting a go call, and then they just go. So the kickoff team has to make a decision. You know, do they wedge through there? Do they bust through there? Do they go around? You know, and obviously that's you know that's their problem, not ours. But it kind of works out that that's what happens. And so this, uh, as we go here, the next uh, slide here, sorry, um, let's get into our hash, hash wedge rules, okay? If, again, we were predominantly a wedge return, kickoff return unit, um, you know, we obviously spent a lot of time on offense and defense, and we put in our time on special teams, but we didn't have time to do a sideline return and a wedge return, okay? Um, it's just the way it worked out. So we stuck with the wedge return, um, and usually I'm a person where you got to you got to have you got to have the same personnel in there. So um, you can have you can have one full unit and a second full unit, or you can have a full unit plus some backups. However you want to do it. I mean, I'll talk about that later, but uh, you got to trust the guys that you have, and you got to continue to work on with 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 various. Um, it's just not doesn't work very well with with a lot of personnel coming in and out you got to keep the consistent personnel working working in there so when you face a team that's uh, not kicking from the middle of the field consistently or giving that five by five uh, formation what you may want to do is go with a hash wedge return and it doesn't change a whole lot except for now your front row is not going to be man to man uh, it's basically a double wedge so again um, you just got to make that determination. Where do you put your personnel? Do you put them to the field? Do you put them in the boundary? Obviously, uh, a hash kickoff team wants to kick it into the corner of that boundary side. So we put our front side or better guys to the boundary. And obviously, the back side is to the field. Uh, again, with a six-man front, you can still do the staggering. You still do the, uh, the shifting, that type of thing. That's up to you. And uh, But now those front six guys are going to be blocking in a wedge, try to drop back as, as far as possible, blocking the most dangerous man inside out. If we go to a five-man front in the row, in the first row, sorry, uh, again, you put your, your front side into the boundary and still follow the wedge rules. <clears throat> your second row or your back level there, they still have wedge rules, again, setting uh, in line with the ball. And again, whoever doesn't catch the ball fit into the wedge, and the ball carrier gives a go call. Uh, looking at this slide here, on your screen, this is a six-man front. Um, again, they don't have man-to-man -man rules. They're just going to try to get drop and get back as, as deep as possible. And 
usually with a six-man front. Our front side middle guy is the wedge setter, um, and they're just dropping back to him basically about 15 yards deep. And then the third level, they get back in the wedge, and our middle wedge guy is setting the wedge. So with the five-man front, you got the five guys up front, the middle man, the center man is setting the wedge, again, trying to drop 15 yards deep as far back as he can. The four guys in the back get back and form their, their second level wedge as well. So uh, let's take a look at another clip where this is game 11 or the first round of the playoffs at the start of the second quarter again. We're up 13 to seven. Um, and this again is the second kickoff return of the game. This is versus a four by six and the ball is on the hash. So you can see that um, the ball's on our right hash, four by six, and by this time, okay, we only have a five-man front. Uh, after game nine, we changed to a five-man front, so we can't get, so we wouldn't get exploited by the bloop kick um, or a squib um, to at an angle where we didn't have a guy there. So we had, we, that added a fourth man to our back row to make sure we covered our outside uh, middle areas, outside the hash, okay? And off the screen there, if I just go back, look at that front row, again, are they getting back to the 35, you know, somewhere between the 40 and the 35, they, they are. Okay, this kick went deeper, this kicker was a better kicker. He got it back to the 10. So our, our back row, our back, back wedge guys, is again about 10 yards in front. They're setting about the 20 or just inside the 20. Again, there's a big space here between our, our front row wedge and our middle wedge, okay? So we're, we're getting some guys leaked in there, but our second level has to take care of it at this point. So our second level takes care of it. Uh, he just, our ball carrier maintains coming right up the middle. Obviously he's, he's shading or he's favoring uh, to the inside, and when you have a hash return, a lot of times what we're trying to do is set the wedge on the hash if possible, depending on where the ball's kicked. And this, uh, obviously, in this case, the ball's on the outside of the hash, so we're a little bit outside the hash. But he maintains keeping inside. We don't want him outside because if we want him outside, we'd do a sideline return, and we don't want him outside. We want to keep him inside or closer to the hash. Okay, so obviously we're able to spill. You know, the first level guys are able, able to spill those guys out just enough. And those second level uh, kickoff return guys basically ran by our return man, didn't want any part of that second wedge. Okay, and our guy makes things happen, you know, beating the last five guys. Okay, and then obviously this last move was critical, being the kicker. But um, again, okay, you get that wedge moving. No one wants to, uh, if you don't have a wedge buster, you're not going to have those guys busting through that wedge. So you got to keep that wedge moving. Here's a end zone shot of that same clip. Okay, you can see again, it's on a hash. They're four by six. Okay, you can see the guys up front. They're, you can tell the difference between this one and the, the middle of the field wedge. You can tell these guys are not on a man. Okay, they're not eyeing a man. They're eyeing a drop. They're, they're eyeing a zone on the field. They're dropping back. Okay. They still got to keep ahead on a swivel, but okay. Again, things are pretty good here. We're getting a lot of outside pressure. <clears throat> the four guys from the four side obviously are not getting blocked. So that's why our return man keeps it down the middle to the inside. Okay. And we just got to go. We got to go and we pick up a couple of those guys plus another guy coming in late from the other side. Okay. And then again, you got to have some special, special kids. You got to work on it. You got to have some fast kids. That helps too. Okay. But as long as you get a hat on a hat, you should be good. So what are some other things, other rules, other returns uh, that you may end up using? Uh, or what are some variations to the last uh, wedge returns I talked about? What if the ball is close to the hash? So maybe it's not in the middle. Maybe it's not exactly on the hash. But what if it's close to the hash? So how do you handle that? Do you handle it like a middle of the field kickoff? Wedge return, uh, do you handle it like a hash kickoff return? You know, what do you do? Well, that's where you gotta look at your tendencies, okay? You gotta, uh, what, what is it your opponent doing through kickoffs? Uh, where are they kicking it from? 
Um, are they more of a deep kickoff team? Are they a squib type team? Are they a blooping team? Do they kick it both ways? Um, do they always kick it on their sideline? Do they, you know, a lot of teams will do that. You know, what's their kickoff formation? Is it five by five all the time? Is it four by six all the time? Are they switching guys around? Are they shifting? You know, what's, what, it, what is it that you need to do when the ball is close to the hash? Well, that's just, you just need to make that decision based on their tendencies and let your kids know this is what we're doing. Okay, so the other question is, well, what do you do with the second row players and return guys? Do you flip them or do you keep them the same? We never flipped our guys. We kept them the same. Okay, so um, in, game, in game one, you saw the guy return it back for a touchdown, but later, you know, about mid-season, he got hurt. So one of the videos you're going to see here in a second is our backup return guy. Well, by the time we got to game 11, that first guy was back. Okay, so again, what do you do with your personnel? Um, you know, basically our return guy in the middle of the season became, was our number two, number two return guy. Um, and they, they were basically our kickoff coverage units were in a pickle because we had two fast kids back there. So it didn't matter who they kicked to, uh, usually we had a successful kickoff return. And it wasn't always taking it to the house, okay? And so, um, as a matter of fact, that last video that you saw in the first kickoff, um, we almost took to the house with the second return guy um, that we, we had a front row player coming in to do a, a last minute kick out and he ended up swiping the legs of our ball carrier and so he didn't house it. But we almost took the first one to the house in the first playoff game. And so you need to, you, need to be, you have to be able to tweak the rules throughout the season as needed, again, through your tendencies, through your personnel, et cetera. Um, and the one thing I'll, I'll tell you that is going to be critical is whoever your kickoff return coach is or who's responsible for that unit, they need to be engaged before the kickoff, during the kickoff, as soon as the ball is kicked off. Um, and, you know, one thing they can't be, they can't lose focus of what's going on. Um, and if you're not on the field, you need to make sure that you communicate to your sideline coach and make sure, again, you're paying attention that whole time because that's where these kickoff teams are now, obviously, uh, squibbing it a lot, onsiding a lot, just first quarter, second quarter, middle of the game, you name it, they're going to do it. Some, some units don't care. Some units do it all the time, whatever. So um, if you're busy talking about the, the next offensive play, you're busy doing something else, you know, sometimes that's going to backfire. So... Uh, here's a clip of the middle of the season, game seven. Our, the return man that you saw return a touchdown earlier in the, uh, the first game of the season. Uh, we didn't want him back there for various reasons based on his injury. So um, we had our number two guy back there, number three guy back there technically. So again, we had some special kids, fast kids. But uh, it was the opening kickoff of game seven. Again, this is a four by six team, but the ball was not on the hash. It was close to the hash, but not on the hash. So how do we line up? Okay, you can see here, this is a sideline angle, but or the wide angle. Okay, it's a four by six. Okay, you can see, let me just run it back here again. Okay, you could tell we're, we have our head on a swivel here, but we're not really eyeing somebody per se. Okay, you can tell we decided that game that we're gonna be a double wedge team. We're gonna treat it like it's on the hash and be a double wedge team here. Okay, and so, let me go back here. So, again, our front line is in a wedge technique. Okay, keep the head on, on a swivel. At this time, again, we were still a uh, six-man front. We hadn't changed yet to a five-man front. We're still a six-man front. So then our back three or four guys are now fitting a wedge as well, the second wedge. Our non-return guys fitting up in there, who's actually our number three returner. Here comes our number two returner. Okay. Again, making something happen, beating three, four, or five guys. So you can get a better view of it here on the next slide. Uh, this clip is from the end zone shot. So again, okay, watch. Again, it's a six-man front row. Okay, not all of our players were, you know, baseball players. Not all of our players were skill players, okay? And we'll talk, I'll talk about that in a second. But, okay, so... The ball is just inside the hash, but it's kicked outside the hash. So basically it's treated like a hash return, in other words. Okay, as long as you gotta get, as long as you get a hat on a hat and let that guy find a seam, then he's probably off to the races. Okay, obviously 
it's important to have some fast kids back there catching the ball, some guys that you trust, okay, some guys that are going to have ball security um, top of their mind and, and make that a priority. But, okay, so what were the personnel things that we went into? What were some of the situational things that you can run into? Um, you know, I'm, I've always been a big fan of seniors. Get your get your seniors that deserve to be on there. There's seniors that showed a lot of leadership throughout the offseason, seniors that put the time and effort in there. Okay, if they're deserving seniors, give them, find them a place to play on special teams. Um, so that's what, obviously what we did. Uh, we had a big senior class. Uh, we made sure our seniors uh, were able to play on special teams and then just go from there. So again, don't make major changes. Use minimal changes, uh, minimal personnel changes, um, so your, your two options are you go with a, a full first unit or starters and then you have subs from there that your subs can be versatile players that have to know both sides or can do two different things or do you go with another mentality that we have two full units okay we did two full units we had a first team we had a second team okay and so then when we needed to we could steal people from that second team again that became players that JV players or younger players that that showed that they deserved to find a spot on the field and, and guys that we could trust, you know, later on, but uh, based on injuries, et cetera, whatever needs you have. But we pulled from that second unit, but throughout practice, everyone got practice reps, first squad, second squad. And again, that's going to depend on how much time you have or what size of team that you have, whether you can do that or not. Some other things that you run into obviously is hands team, uh, which goes without saying, you know, versus onside kicks. Uh, or special situations, you may want to throw them out there. Obviously, hands team uh, are going to be some of your skill players. Maybe find some a lot of your baseball players. Again, that maybe not, maybe he's not an offensive or defensive starter, but he's a baseball kid, a kid you can trust, or a kid from the JV team that can fill the first two rows. Um, and then your your back two guys don't have to be speedsters. It's guys that you can trust that can just catch it, make some decisions, take a knee, whatever, um, in the back in the back there, returning the ball. So. Um, a lot of times, if you see a squib team um, late in a game situation, maybe it's not an onside uh, situation, but it's a team that's squibbing or wants a squib late in the game, or maybe even late in the season, like we saw late in the season. You know, once we we housed three kickoff returns from game one and game seven, okay, and then or two at that time, you know, then we had well actually three after our first playoff game. Then when we hit our second playoff game, we, we found a team that obviously didn't want any business kicking off to us and kicking deep. So they were squibbing as much as they could or, or making sure that we didn't field it. So that's where we had to make a decision during that game to take basically our hands team unit or, or other skill guys and make and, and f fill a wedge return unit. Um, and again, what's one of the advantages of using a wedge return is it's simple. Okay, and again, another advantage of using a second unit. These are guys that's gotten reps all se for 12 weeks or more, maybe 16 weeks. They've been repping this. Uh, when you throw them out there, they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be lacking the confidence to go out there and get the job done. So again, that's something that uh, we had to put in sort of a, a spur of the moment thing in the second playoff game where we had a squib team. That, that's all they wanted to do is squib. They didn't want us to get any type of uh, field position or take it to the house. Now, we probably averaged uh, our offense on the 40 yard line, on the minus 40 yard line that game. So we were always starting the offense on the minus 40 or better. Um, but, you know, at least, you know, they were trying to prevent us from taking it to the house. So we had to use, again, uh, you know, 11 players that were all skilled players, game, uh, baseball players, kids that we could trust to field the ball. But they knew our wedge return. So if we could try to get a return, we, we, obviously, we obviously would. Hey, guys, I uh, hope that helped. Um, you know, again, that's that's more emphasis on the wedge return uh, and just what we did this year. Um, I've always been someone that we I would do both. I would do sideline and wedge, or I would just do sideline, or in this case, we just did wedge this year. But um, I think you need to to take a hard look at your personnel, uh, how many how many people you have on your team, how many you know JV players you have or underclassmen you have that could that could help um, provide some opportunity for them to to support those units and then make that decision. What do you want to do? You want to do sideline returns the whole season? You want to do wedge? Can you do both or not? Um, are you a five-man front or you're a six-man front? I say five-man or six-man, but eventually our six-man turned into basically 
a four two. Uh, so you really, it's really a four man front with some two deeper guys. Um, and we kind of, I didn't really go into that, but we kind of progressed our six man front basically from a four, into a four man front with, with two staggered back about, you know, seven yards deep or so. So that's another way you could do it as well. And you could still maintain those three guys in the back and your two returners. Hey guys, I know there's a lot going on in the world uh, right now. This is 2020 uh, coronavirus. So I hope you're staying well. Um, stay healthy, stay fit, stay close to your family and God bless.